All right, AP Human, it's Mr. Majewski. Uh, I am very much under the weather. This is after uh, open house, uh, but I'm going to fight through it because I feel like you folks need an agriculture review. Uh, so obviously I have a cold and it's really acting up on me. Uh, so bear with me. All right, hopefully it's not too much of a distraction for you. Hopefully there are not coughing and or sneezing fits. Uh, I want to start with uh, the top of the review session. I should say the review sheet. Um, and I talk, hey, you have to focus on the vocab. Now, I always tell you that, but especially this test. This test has a lot of definition-related questions. Now, they're not going to be just what's the defini what is this a definition of, uh, but you must know the definitions from your vocab in order to do well on the test. And that's one of the reasons why you need to have your vocab done by the time we take the test so that you can know those terms. Uh, you need to know... The major agricultural hearths are for plant and animal domestication, along with basic information about each hearth. For instance, when it originated, uh, what crops or animals were developed there. Uh, it says know the major seed and plant hearths. Um, to be honest with you, just know the major plant and animal hearths. Um, and I'm going to actually go to one of our previous slides here where we went through the agricultural hearths. This is from Introduction to the Geography of Agriculture. So again, uh, we have four major agricultural hearths for crops. Uh, the first is Southwest Asia. That's believed to be probably the oldest, um, the original, sometimes referred to as the Fertile Crescent, uh, because that region of the world uh, is an area where a bunch of rivers m merge together, and so there's a lot of really fertile river valleys in that area. We know that wheat and barley were uh, originally domesticated in Southwest Asia, olive and lentil beans as well. Now, wheat and barley are by far the most important, um, but of course there are others as well. Indeed, if you look at the map on the next page, and of course you have these notes as well, you're going to see there's a number of other products that are developed there. Now, you don't need to know each one by heart, uh, but you do need to know the main ones. Wheat and barley are really the first to be domesticated, and then most of the wheats that follow, oats, rye, um, also uh, emerge there. So that's the oldest, Southwest Asia, oftentimes called the Fertile Crescent. Um, it's the original. It's considered by many to be the most significant. How did it diffuse? Well, it diffused west towards Europe and obviously eastward towards Central Asia. All right. Second major agricultural hearth that you need to be familiar with is East Asia. Uh, the first crops to be domesticated there were rice, uh, possibly millet. Obviously, East Asia located right here. Uh, rice, the dominant crop. Uh, ultimately, they, they diffuse throughout the rest of Asia into South Asia and eventually into Southeast Asia as well. Again, about 8,000 BC, so 10,000 years ago. Third major hearth, uh, Central and Sub-Saharan Africa. Sorghum, yams, uh, possibly some millet and rice, but really no sorghum and yams. Um, and, of course, uh, they develop it independently as well. Um, and uh, it starts to spread south throughout the rest of Africa um, from the original hearth area. All right, last major crop hearth you need to be familiar with is Latin America. That's the most recent. It's only 4,000 years old, 2000 BC. Uh, it depended where you were. In the Mexico area where the Aztec and the Maya were dominant, it was corns and late corn and then later beans, cotton, and squash. Uh, in Peru, it was potato first. Uh, and then later on corn as well. And of course, from this hearth, these plant domestications spread throughout the rest of North and South America. So those are your four major crop hearths. Yes, I know there's this one over in Southeast Asia as well. Uh, a lot of tropical fruits are discovered there. It's generally not considered to be um, what I would call one of our more dominant hearth areas. By the way, Every one of the hearths that I just described are seed hearths, all righty? So they actually learn to plant seeds in order to produce crops instead of just putting pieces of uh, the plant into the ground and growing it from that. Animal hearths, well, again, we've got three major hearth areas. Um, the first is obviously Southwest Asia, again, the first to domesticate plants, also the first to domesticate animals. Dogs are the first way back in 10,000 B.C., 12,000 years ago. Then in the same area, about six to 7,000 BC, cattle, goats, pigs, sheep, all domesticated. Uh, it also was the first area that both raises animals while they grow crops. Um, so they're the first to develop that. 
Uh, the animals were used to clear the land, prepare the land. Crops were then grown on it, used to oftentimes feed the animals. All right? Um, anyways, second major animal hearth is Central Asia. Um, they have the horse. They're the first to domesticate the horse. This, of course, is why Central Asia today is associated with, uh, throughout history, uh, strong horsemen and warriors uh, because they had a head start over the rest of the world in terms of domestication of that animal. All right. Uh, third major animal hearth is, uh, is South Asia, the chicken. Uh, we know um, uh, is uh, originally domesticated there as well. So again, please notice all of these um, animals get domesticated in Southwest Asia, with the exception of the horse, which is Central Asia, the chicken, which is South Asia, and, of course, can't forget about the turkey and the llama, uh, which were the unique to Latin America, and so they were uh, domesticated there first. All right, so those are our major plant and animal hearths. Um, and, uh, that should at least get us through that potential question, uh, on the review sheet. Uh, you should know the four types of subsistence agriculture and where each type is primarily located or distributed. Uh, you have to do the same with the seven types of commercial agriculture, um, and where each type is primarily distributed as well. Now, hey, I'm not going to go through each individual type. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you this, all right? Uh, I'm going to add this sheet to Haiku. Uh, I'll also print it out for you. Uh, it answers those questions on the review sheet. Now, first, it gives characteristics of commercial ag. It's mostly practiced in MDCs. It usually involves producing crops for sale at the market, not for your own use. It often involves much higher levels of technology and efficiency or production. Uh, and much less of the population works in agriculture in these countries. Commercial agriculture focuses on making the greatest number of crops as possible on the land for sale, for profit. Uh, it really started after the second agricultural revolution in Europe and the U.S. now that those countries had an abundance of crops more than they needed. Uh, there are actually, by my count, six types of um, commercial agriculture. Mixed crop and livestock, uh, dairy farming, um, livestock ranching, commercial grain farming, Mediterranean ag, commercial gardening and fruit farming. Oh, and I gotta, I gotta actually change that uh, because we would be dumb to not include plantation agriculture because it is technically commercial ag, even if it's the only commercial type of ag that's actually done in LDCs. Alrighty, so I'm gonna relocate that up to commercial ag because that's where plantation farming belongs. Don't get confused. It's commercial ag even though it's done in LDCs. You're going to notice I don't go into detail on these types of agriculture. You, I leave that up to you. I tell you what they are. You need to be able to differentiate these from one another. So you need to tell me the differences between mixed crop and livestock, dairy, commercial grain, livestock, Mediterranean, commercial gardening and fruit farming, which we often call truck farming. Um, and I've already done the work for you on plantation agriculture, right? It's a commercial agriculture that's practiced in LDCs for the benefit of populations and MDCs. There are usually large farms called plantations that are owned by corporations. They specialize in the production of one or a few what are called cash crops, coffee, tobacco, potentially cotton, uh, maybe specialty fruits and vegetables that are desired in MDCs, um, but maybe not so much in the area where they are uh, cultivated. Uh, they use LDC workers to take advantage of low cost, low wages. They're often separated, often operated, I should say, in tropical climates. Uh, they'll always be located near coastlines because, remember, they need to ship those products to the MDCs as quickly as possible. Uh, and so the plantations are oftentimes located near the coastline. There's very often a processing facility on site in plantation agriculture where they'll actually process the food on site, turn it into juice or other materials. Um, and again, if they are producing food, it's usually exotic or tropical fruit. Um, that people in developed countries expect year-round. Uh, anyways, you need to do the same sort of thing with the other six types of commercial ag so that you uh, know the general characteristics of it um, and uh, kind of where it is located. Now, the good news for you is, look, I did that for you on subsistence. One, I give you the general characteristics of subsistence agriculture, and then I give you the specific details about each 
of the four major types of subsistence ag, shifting agriculture, also known as slash and burn, uh, intensive subsistence, um, both wet rice and non-rice, and then, of course, pastoral nomadism, our herders. So again, this work has been done for you uh, for those next two questions uh, to try to make things a little bit easier for you. All right, so hopefully that helps you out. Um, that should take us through both this question and this question, although admittedly, you're going to need to fill in the details about some of those types of commercial agriculture. All right. Uh, know which regions of the country produce which types of meat through livestock ranching and subsistence agriculture. Uh, I actually think that that should be regions of the world. Um, and so what we would do is we would go to our commercial agriculture slides. We would give them a second, hopefully, to refresh. Good Lord. I'm um, still waiting for you to refresh there, friends. And then we go to this slide, right, which was another slide we looked at in class. Uh, this shows you the areas where major ranching operations occur. You must know the American, North America, Western North America produces cattle, uh, cattle ranches. You need to know South America is most widely known for cattle, especially Brazil and Argentina in that region that's called the Pampas. Uh, you need to know Australia is most normally associated with sheep uh, raising, um, especially because they can thrive in drier environments. Um, throughout Europe, you'll see a mixture of different um, animals that are raised. Um, however, uh, most of the commercial agriculture, and the commercial is indicated by these uh, areas that have the lines through them, you'll notice only Australia, South America, Western North America, South Africa, which raises sheep, and then a little bit of Central Asia, which also raises sheep ranches, um, are the only places that actually ranch, uh, that actually raise animals for commercial purposes. So again, this shows you all the areas of the world where animals are raised, but the areas that have these purple lines kind of through them, right there, right there, right there, right there, right there, those are the areas that are specifically commercial ranching uh, instead of pastoral nomadism. Anyways, that'll take us through uh, the areas where major ranch or meat production is occurring. Um, be able to explain von Thunen's theory on agricultural distribution in detail, including the model itself, including and specifically each of its rings. Okay. Assumptions made with the model and the strengths and weaknesses associated with the model today. All right, well, your notes included all of this stuff, so hopefully you were paying attention when we went through von Thunen. All right, first off, his model, co model claims to be able to identify the loga location of types of agriculture around a market. All right, so we're going to start with the rings of activity. First, he says, there is a city center. That's where the market is. Immediately surrounding that city center is going to be a ring of dairy and intensive farming. First, you're going to have commercial uh, gardening and fruit farming uh, because their goods are so perishable. Uh, they're very intensive uses of the land. They need to get those products to market before they perish, those high-value, uh, highly perishable goods. Then it's going to be dairies as well in that same ring uh, for the same reason. They're producing milk, other dairy products. They need to get to the market quickly. Um, and uh, the cost of transportation for these goods is going to be high. Secondly, next ring uh, around that market um, is going to be the forest ring. Remember, uh, timber, firewood uh, are going to be produced as fuel or building materials here. Wood is heavy, so therefore Von Thunen said that'll be the next ring around the city uh, so that the people that live in that city still have close access to that very heavy wood that they depend on. third major zone around the market is our grains, uh, our extensive field crops. Uh, for instance, corn, wheat, and other grains. Uh, they can last longer. They're not as perishable as fresh fruit uh, or market gardening. Uh, they're not as perishable as dairy, and they're lighter to transport. If you pick up an armload of grain versus an armload of wood, the wood's going to weigh a lot heavier, right? Uh, so therefore, these people can afford to be located further from the market because their transportation costs will be much less. The last ring is going to be ranching or livestock. Uh, that's going to be the furthest from the city, the market. Those animals have the cheapest method of transportation. They transport themselves. They're self-transporting. 
Uh, so therefore, the farmer can afford to locate those far enough away because he won't have to pay transportation costs uh, because um, the animals will move themselves. All right? Beyond that last ring, he said, uh, was a zone of wilderness where nothing was grown because it was just too far away from the city market uh, to make it profitable for any crop to grow. All right? Uh, the assumptions of Von Thunen's model. Uh, boy, he has a lot of them. All right, let's go to these assumptions because this is really where it starts. Remember, he assumes... Uh, that the city is located centrally in an isolated state that's not connected to any others. We know that there are really no states in the world that are like that. He argues it's completely self-sufficient. It has no external influences. It has no interaction or relation with any other outside state. That's, again, an assumption that really isn't really – doesn't really exist very much in modern society, too. Uh, the isolated state is surrounded by an unoccupied wilderness. Remember, he already stated that. Um, so our state is isolated, is completely cut off, and is not connected in any way to any other states. Three, remember he says the land of the state is completely flat, it has no rivers, it has no mountains. Um, it's all the same flat land. Um, we know obviously there's no place in the world that has those characteristics. Uh, but for the sake of his model, these are the assumptions that he made. Assumption number four, remember, uh, the soil quality, the climate are going to be the same throughout the country, throughout the state. Uh, assumption number five, farmers are transporting by their own ox cart. They're, they're using ox carts uh, to transport their goods themselves directly to the center of the city. There's no roads. They transport the shortest possible route uh, regardless of what's in the way of them. Uh, and the last assumption is that farmers are going to act to maximize their profits. All right? Uh, flaws. Uh, first off, the strengths of, uh, of Von Thunen's model. Von Thunen's model. Uh, the first strength is... It has a lot of accuracy today in places like the United States. The U.S. seems to follow this pattern if we assume that the major markets are located on the East Coast. Um, so it has a lot of accuracy, and uh, it seems to be accurate in a lot of countries of the world. Um, and, uh, and it does do a good job uh, of describing all agriculture, whether it is subsistence or commercial. All right. Uh, negatives. Uh, what are the problems with Von Thunen's model? Well, the first major problem is, uh, remember, we don't have this ring anymore because we don't need it. We develop uh, steam engines. Um, ultimately, we develop gasoline-powered engines. We develop uh, heating and air conditioning. We no longer need this, this wood ring, uh, so it no longer exists. All right. So this is one that Von Thunen uh, got wrong in modern times. Uh, he didn't take into account things like refrigeration, better transportation and distribution, the development of roads and railroads, new methods of transportation, all of these, which would cause some of his ideas to become less valid than they had been before. All right? Um, doesn't take into account moder modern uh, inventions, innovations like refrigeration, uh, like transportation. Uh, and ultimately, yeah, um, it, uh, it is accurate to a point, to a fault, uh, but it's not completely accurate and it doesn't tell the whole story um, about agriculture in modern times. Be able to describe Bozrup's theory in each of its five stages of intensification. Folks, we're doing that in class on Wednesday. Uh, we're going to start class with that. Um, so I don't really feel the need to go over it because I'm going to cover that in class tomorrow, the day before the exam. Be able to identify the different ways that geographers differentiate subsistence from commercial ag. I kind of already did that, right, where I showed you this slide. I, I should, should say this page uh, kind of gives you the differences between the two. But remember, it's pretty easy. Uh, commercial farms are larger. There are less of them. Um, less people work in agriculture on commercial farms than subsistence. Remember, about 2 to 5% of the population. All right. Um, Commercial farms grow crops for export, for profit. They use a great deal of machinery and technology. Um, and uh, their goal is to try to create as intensive agriculture as they can. Uh, what we mean by that is they're going to try to grow the maximum amount they can on the land that they have. All right. Uh, subsistence agriculture is growing crops for your own needs, right, as opposed to selling them. Uh, it's designed to feed the farmer, maybe the surrounding village, but that's it. It's mostly done in LDCs. It was the primary method of agriculture throughout most of our history. Only since the second agricultural revolution 
uh, has commercial developed. Uh, it replaced hunting and gathering. It's considered very extensive. It uses a lot of land, uh, but doesn't produce as many crops uh, compared to other types of agriculture. Uh, it's definitely got a lack of technology. Um, they tend to not use a lot of technology or any at all. A lot of human power, um, maybe animal power um, in some instances. Farms are smaller. Uh, uh, there are more of them. There are more people are involved in agriculture in subsistence countries. They do not tend to use machines. Um, and if they do, they are kind of older or outdated uh, or basic sorts of machines. Uh, generally, they use human and animal power. All right. Let's get back to our questions on the review sheet. I know I'm jumping around a little bit today. Gosh dang it. Here we go. Um, know each of the three agricultural revolutions in human history and briefly describe each. All right. Uh, the first agricultural revolution occurred about ten to 12,000 years ago. Um, it was when we switched for the first time from hunting and gathering uh, over to domesticated permanent agriculture in one place. Happened in Southwest Asia, right, in the Middle East. It happened in what we call the Fertile Crescent. Um, and uh, again, uh, this is uh, significant because it's the first time that any group of humans permanently started growing agriculture instead of hunting and or gathering nuts and berries. All right. Uh, the second agricultural revolution happened about four or five hundred years ago. It happened about the same time as the Industrial Revolution. Uh, it's when some countries that industrialize switch from subsistence over to commercial agriculture. We start to see the development of machines like plows. Uh, we start to see massive increases in efficiency and production um, in MDCs as they begin for the first time to start to grow crops for export, for trade purposes. Uh, they now have an excess amount, uh, a, a surplus uh, that allows them to sell that to the market uh, because they have more than they need for themselves. That's what happens when you use machinery and new methods of intensification to grow more crops on the same piece of land. The third agricultural revolution, also known as the Green Revolution, occurred about 40 to 50, uh, about in the 1940s and 50s, and this continued on today. It's when many of the innovations that MDCs developed during the second agricultural revolution are going to be brought over to developing countries, uh, things like fertilizers, pesticides, uh, herbicides. Uh, in addition to that, we start to see uh, the development of genetically modified seeds and plants, um, which are then shipped over to LDCs to massively increase production now in LDCs uh, to meet the needs of those rising populations in LDC countries. So again, this is when a lot of the methods, a lot of the technology, a lot of the materials of MDCs starts to find its way over to the LDCs. Either the LDC countries purchase them or more times than not, they were provided as economic aid or assistance uh, by the core countries to the developing world. So those are your three agricultural revolutions. Uh, be able to explain different reasons for worldwide crop loss. Desertification. Uh, of course, this is when land is overused. Uh, or uh, agricultural land is lost in arid or semi-arid areas. Deserts tend to expand, especially if people are overusing the land. Um, then that has a tendency to cause that land to lose its nutrients uh, and slowly become desert landscape as well. Uh, another good reason why we're seeing crop loss as well uh, is deforestation. Oftentimes, certain types of agriculture uh, are grown in forest, especially tropical forest areas, um, and so a lot of the times, uh, forestry companies, timber companies, uh, logging operations would like to remove that agriculture from that area so that they can have that land to chop the trees down um, instead. Are worldwide agricultural lands growing or shrinking? They're actually growing. We actually have more agricultural land now than we did at the start of the 1900s. That's because we've used irrigation uh, and other methods uh, to increase agricultural land uh, from what it looked like in 1900. So lands are actually growing. Even as the population goes up, uh, the question is, uh, can we create new agricultural lands, specifically enough of them to meet the needs of the new populations? Probably not. 
Uh, what is prime agricultural land? What's an example of it being lost? Prime agricultural land is the best possible land that crops can be grown in an area. Uh, normally, we associate prime agricultural land with Mediterranean agriculture. Those areas are so unique, uh, so special, and so productive uh, that they're considered to be the best or the prime, the premium agricultural lands that are out there. And when we lose those, uh, we lose those permanently oftentimes. Uh, what's an example? Well, a city sprawl as they spread outward. A lot of times they spread into surrounding nearby fields, uh, which means a lot of times prime agricultural land is lost because of urban sprawl as cities expand outward. Be able to, do, to explain how different methods of crop rotation work and the major benefit of each. Hey, folks, again, just like uh, crop uh, Bose Reps theory, I'm going to cover crop rotation again tomorrow in class. Um, so I'm going to hold off on going over that during the review. Know which area or sector of the economy agriculture is. Agriculture is a primary job. Remember, primary jobs extract things from the earth, uh, natural resources from the earth, and crops are most definitely that. All right? Uh, we're not manufacturing anything. We're not taking crops and turning them into a product. The farmer's job is just to grow the crops. All right? Um, major problems for commercial agriculture. Overproduction. Okay. Um, so one of the big problems in MDCs is that commercial farms tend to produce more than we need. That means we have an excess amount of surplus. Uh, we have more supply than demand, which causes prices to go down. Um, problem for, for them is uh, they lose money every year as prices go down. Uh, so their solution is to try to produce more than they did each year to try to make up for the losses in decreased prices. The problem, of course, is that this is a cycle, and the more that they produce, the more they're driving down the value of their crop. Uh, so anyways, uh, one of the things, remember, that the government does um, is uh, they uh, buy excess crops. Uh, U.S. and European governments buy excess crops from farmers, and then they destroy them to try to eliminate that excess amount. Remember, uh, the government will give subsidies to farmers, which is a cash payment, uh, to encourage them to continue to grow a crop uh, if the price of that crop gets to be too low. Uh, and, of course, remember, sometimes the government will provide money to a farmer uh, to grow a less profitable crop um, that we don't have as much of, um, and the government will chip in and pay the difference uh, from the original crop that they were growing to the replacement crop. If they make less with the replacement crop, the government chips in. The difference is there. All of these are, are designed to eliminate the overproduction. Uh, to try to help farmers get higher prices for their goods. The other major challenge for commercial farmers, uh, it, well, one, it's environmentally devastating, but um, is sustainable agriculture, organic farming. A lot of MDC consumers are starting to move towards more organic or sustainable ag. Uh, they consider it healthier. Um, they consider it to be um, higher quality. Um, and uh, they're worried about maybe some of the chemicals or materials that commercial farmers are putting into crops in order to produce as many as they can. Um, let's get to the next question. Major problems for commercial ag. Meeting the needs of growing population. Remember, uh, the population continues to grow, uh, and so it falls on a lot of commercial farms to try to produce more to meet the needs of that population. Uh, remember, how do they do that? Uh, they're going to try to create new agricultural lands out of lands that didn't exist before. They're going to try to produce more on the lands that they're already using, like the Green Revolution. They're going to try to identify new food sources um, that consumers do not want at this time but might desire in the future uh, to develop new sources of food, especially ocean food, which is known as aquaculture. Um... And, uh, yeah, those are the primary methods by which commercial farms adapt uh, to try to continue to grow more and to meet the needs of the world's population. All right? Problems um, for – by the way, this should be LDC, not commercial ag. This should be subsistence ag down here. Mr. M, this review sheet has some problems. Uh, meeting the needs of their growing population and balancing the needs of development through trade with feeding their population. Okay. The biggest issue that LDC farms have, well, the biggest issue is they are in debt. They can't afford the pesticides, the fertilizer, the herbicides, the machines uh, that they need in order to produce their efficiency. Uh, and, uh, and so they're permanently getting into perpetual debt. Uh, it's getting worse and worse. A lot of them might lose their farms if they are not careful. Second major issue 
uh, is that a lot of times LDC farms are growing commercial crops uh, to be sold in MDCs. Why? Because remember, the whole goal of international trade is for your country to develop unique products that the rest of the world wants. A lot of times for an LDC, those are agricultural crops. Um, and so a lot of the agricultural production in an LDC is not actually benefiting the LDC's population. Uh, it's going to MDC consumers. So choice available farmland in LDC countries is not being used to benefit the people that live there. Other challenges for LDC farmers, uh, drug crops. Uh, a lot of times farmers might be able to make more by growing marijuana or opium or cocaine. Uh, and when they do these things, um, those are technically considered uh, agricultural methods that are not benefiting the development of the country as a whole and definitely not feeding the population. All right. Um, we've got four more questions to get through. Hopefully Mr. Majewski's voice is going to hold up. All right. Be able to explain what sustainable agriculture is, including the three fundamental aspects of it. Okay, so sustainable agriculture is a new type of agriculture. Organic farming is the most um, well-known variety of it. Uh, it's based on uh, trying to be more, uh, better manage um, agriculture in MDCs. Uh, what is it based on? Three fundamental aspects. Well, one, um, they are not going to use um, harmful chemicals like pesticides or chemical fertilizers um, in their production methods. They prefer natural fertilizers like animal waste. Um, they believe in a lot more tender love and care, human uh, activity to produce the, the crops rather than chemical or machine power. Um, in many ways, it's a return to traditional agriculture only done for commercial purposes. Uh, because they're using workers in MDCs to do this organic farming, um, the cost of these crops and the time it takes to make them um, causes prices to be very high for these products. So one, uh, we're going to move away from artificial materials like chemical pesticides, uh, fertilizers, um, and herbicides, uh, and try to use more natural methods instead. Second major uh, fundamental aspect of uh, uh, sustainable agriculture is we're going to more efficiently use water. Uh, we're better going to be able to manage water um, so that we're not wasting it. Uh, that would involve methods like ridge tillage, uh, which can preserve more water in a more equitable way. The last method is, hey, they do a better job of integrating animal and crop, crop management. Um, they, uh, they really take uh, care of their animals a great deal better. Uh, they believe in things like free range where they're not caged up. Uh, they believe that happy animals are healthy animals. Uh, they produce healthier, more nutritious, and more productive meats. Uh, so again... Um, moving away from, from, uh, from synthetic substances like chemicals, pesticides, that sort of stuff, better management of water, uh, and then better integration of crop and animal management on the farm. Everything that is done on that farm, um, is done, uh, oftentimes either specifically, uh, for the benefit of the animals, uh, or to dry, try to grow the healthiest, the most nutritious, the most productive crops for humans using natural methods, all right? Um, how do they better integrate crop and animal management? Like I told you, they're going to use animal waste as fertilizer instead of chemicals. Um, they are going to have the animals clear the land a lot of the time as opposed to plows or tractors. Um, they are uh, going to feed particular crops to the animals, although not very many, uh, because on organic farms, the, the crops are valuable, they're pricey, so you don't necessarily want to waste them on animals. Uh, you should be able to associate certain terrain features or growing activities to specific regions. Uh, like where are terraced landscapes? They're in Asia. Why? Because you need to terrace the land, which means flatten it for rice. Which um, growing activity uses combines? Uh, grain farms do because you got to cut, reap that grain, uh, and the combine is the machine that not only mows the grain, uh, it also separates the stock from the seed. It also actually binds the grain, which means ties it up as well. Uh, which uh, which type of agriculture uses camels the most? Well, that would be pastoral nomadism in dry, arid areas. So again, if I ask you a question like that, you got to need to know and be able to associate um, that specific characteristic with that particular type of agriculture. Carl Sauer's theory on a human interaction with the environment, it's very simple. He says, hey, 
Um, we influence our environment, our landscape, uh, for our own purposes, our own needs. Uh, and a, the culture of a, of a group of people and a place uh, is dependent on how they modify the environment. So just like language and religion um, and um, ethnicity and your practices um, might be considered your culture or cultural characteristics, Sauer argues, hey, so is what we do to the land. If we modify the land in a very unique way, for instance, for agriculture, um, and it's different uh, than other areas around us, uh, then well then clearly um, that landscape, that agriculture is an example of our cultural traditions and therefore the land itself is an example of our culture. That's called the cultural landscape. All right. So when humans modify the environment uh, where they live, um, Sauer argued that is just as much example of that culture of that people and that place uh, as the language, the religion uh, would be. All right. Uh, last question. How can food taboos and climate help to explain agricultural decisions in some places? All right. Well, hey, if there are taboos against particular foods, obviously, uh, that generally means that food's not going to be grown there. For instance, uh, we don't see a lot of pigs being raised in the Middle East. We don't see a lot of, of um, uh, we don't see any ranching taking place in India or in predominantly Hindu areas. All right. Um, it could also be things like um, if you have a taboo against a particular food or you have preference for a particular food, like wine, um, then that's going to cause your community or your country to probably produce more grapes for wine if that's considered part of your kind of cultural preferences. How does climate affect agriculture decisions? Think about it. Um, if, uh, if your land is too wet, right? You're probably going to need to grow things like rice, right? If your land is too dry, you're probably going to have to raise livestock um, or become a herder if it's an LDC. Um, if the land is too cold, uh, again, then you're probably going to have to modify your behavior uh, to uh, have herds of animals, maybe like the reindeer example we watched in class, all right? Um, and, uh, you know, uh, if it's too hot, all right, for most types of agriculture, uh, well, then you're probably going to rely on a method like slash and burn. Um, if the soil is not nutritious enough, right, you're going to modify that soil or pick a particular agricultural type that benefits you based on where you live. So food taboos, climate, you better believe they influence what crops are grown and where they are grown. Uh, because just like geography, food taboos and climate influence what can be grown on a particular piece of land. I uh, think of Mediterranean, right, with that unique climate. Uh, it's the only places in the world where we have that hot uh, summer uh, with the cool ocean winds um, and that kind of cools off the soil and produces those unique uh, nutrient levels. So again, culture and climate uh, absolutely affect what crops are grown. Mr. M signing off. Uh, hopefully this was helpful to you. I must admit, I'm operating at about 15% efficiency right now. Uh, so this might not be my very best review, but hopefully there's enough information in there to help you as you're reviewing for Thursday's exam. Thank you, folks. All right. Have a great night. Take care.